This is a resource of Just Loving God. Why We Love Christ from Psalm 25, verse 15. I'm going to talk about why I love God. I'm going to talk about what God has done in my life and why I love him so much. And then Paul wrote this. He said, For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. That was Paul's heart. That was what was at the center of his preaching and his teaching and his thinking and his meditation and his praise to God. So I'm going to try and tell you a small part of why my eyes are ever toward the Lord. My text is Psalm 25, verse 15. My eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he will pluck my feet out of the net. Paul says this, Thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, for his inexpressible gift. Well, that means it's quite hard to express if it's inexpressible. So by some small measure, I'm going to give you a small hint, maybe a small, the slightest glimmer of why I love God, to try and describe this gift that he's given me. I'm going to speak to you of the mysteries of God. I'm going to try and measure the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe. This is a mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to the saints. And you know, even if I'm given all of eternity to ponder God, to ponder who he is, what he's done for mankind, I'm never even going to begin to, to gain hardly any ground. I may, maybe a bit, maybe a fair amount, but oh, compared to how glorious God is, compared to how good he is, compared to his grace, his mercy, his justice, I won't, even, I won't even start. I won't even reach one of the smallest foothills of Everest. These are things that angels long to look into. And I'm going to do my best to share with you why I love God, why my eyes are ever toward the Lord. When I started writing this, the first thing I thought of was the cross. My eyes are ever toward the Lord because of what he did on that old rugged cross. I talked to a lady a few days ago. She's, she's not a Christian. She doesn't know God. I told her about God. I told her what he'd done in my life. I told her this glorious gospel. And then when I'd done that, when I'd reached the end of my breath, I said, you know, I love God. I love him so much. And she looked at me and she said, I know. And I thought, wow, what a, what a thing that's happened to me where I'm so in love with God that those around me can just see it so evidently, that I'm so grateful to him. And you know, we talk about the love of God, we talk about the justice of God, and we try and separate God's characteristics, his attributes, into nice little puzzle pieces. But you can't really separate God. You can't separate him into love and justice, that those are somehow in conflict. You can't separate him into goodness and mercy and grace. Yes, he is unchangeable. He's omnipotent. He's om omnipresent and omniscient. He is good. He is wrathful against sin. He is perfect. He is jealous. He is holy. He is blessed. But he is all those things, all at once, all together. And at the very center, if you like, the, the very the best way to try and begin to see who God is, is to look at the cross. This is this, uh, a harmonization, if you like, of God's attributes, God's character. We see clearly how love and justice can be combined together. We see it. We understand. We see how he could be just to forgive sin when he is holy and he finds sin so abhorrent. There's no need for compromising God. He doesn't need to compromise anything. He is who he is. He apologizes to no one. That's one of the reasons I love God because of who he is, because of his character, because of his attributes. And there are so many reasons I love him. I love him because he loved me first. I love him because of what he did on the cross. I love him because in him, in Christ, is salvation. I love him because he calls all men everywhere to repent. I love that. I love him because faith is simple. How nice is that? It's so simple, so easy. It's not complicated. We don't have to jump through hoops and learn to do a backflip. I could go on, I could go on. But firstly, let's look at the cross more. You know, on the cross, Jesus was forsaken by God. He was forsaken by God. He cried, my God, my God, 
Why have you forsaken me? As he hung on that tree. Isaiah 53 says, The Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. He felt the favor of God leave him. He felt God's presence, God's enjoyment of him, God's grace on him. He felt that leave, depart from him. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine all the goodness in the world leaving? Because every good thing in this world is from God. The fact that we can enjoy the sun, that we can enjoy the wind on our face, that we have taste buds and can experience joy and pleasure, and that the music exists. What a glorious thing God made with music. All of those things, imagine everything and the presence of God leaving Jesus. Imagine the horror. The father turned away from the son. He didn't turn away because he was just so upset with what was happening to Jesus. Oh, he was. But he turned away because Jesus was bearing our sin. And God cannot look on sin. He is too holy and too pure. That's why I love God. That's why I love him. That's why I'm so grateful to him. You know, he was a scapegoat as well. He was lifted up in our place. That's another reason I love him. The death of Christ brought appeasement to God's wrath. It brought us peace. He was lifted up in our place and he calls all men to look to him for salvation. In the Old Testament, we read of God sending serpents among the people. They'd sinned. They turned away from him again and again. If anyone's read the Old Testament, you'll see that pattern. And God told Moses to make a bronze serpent. He told him to make a bronze serpent and place it on a pole and set it in the camp. And everyone who was bitten by a snake, he told them to go look at this serpent and they would live. They wouldn't die. And then Jesus related this story from the Old Testament to himself in the Gospel of John chapter 3. He says to Nicodemus, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. So in our place, he was crucified. He was lifted up so that we could be healed. That's why I love God. That's why I rejoice and praise him. You know, he became sin who knew no sin. Second Corinthians. For our sake, he made himself to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So our sin was imputed to him. He bore our sin in our guilt. And his righteousness was imputed to us. And God is holy. He, there is no part of him which can be with sin. Evil can't dwell with him. God didn't become a sinner, but he bore our sin. He carried our guilt. That's why I love him. That's why my eyes are ever towards this God. You know, he became a curse for us as well. Galatians 3, it says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapters 27 to 28 in the Old Testament, we read of the, the people of Israel, and God tells them half of the camp to stand on one mountain and half of the camp to face them on the other mountain, and looking at each other in these two mountains. And he tells those on Mount Gerizim to pronounce the blessings of obeying God. There's many blessings for obeying him. But on the other mountain, Mount Ebal, he, he told them, to pronounce the curses for disobeying God. And there are many of those as well. So God became, Jesus became a curse for us. He took the curse of not obeying the law, of not following God. He took that on himself so that we could be seen as perfect law keepers and inherit all of the blessings for keeping the law. That's why my eyes are ever towards the king of peace, this prince he took the curses that were rightly mine. That's why I love him. And you know, he suffered the wrath of God in our place. I love him so much for that. You can't really understand what that means until you begin to think about God's anger against sin. When you begin to consider that and ponder that. In Ezekiel, God says, And I sought for a man among them who should build up the wall and stand in the breach before me for the land, that I should not destroy it. But I found none. Ezekiel 22 verse 30. God found no one to stand in the breach, in the gap before him, to shield Israel from his wrath against their sin. He didn't find anyone. He couldn't, he couldn't see anyone who could. There was no one to stand there. 
In Exodus, we read of Moses. Moses pleaded with God to turn from his wrath. As God has said, oh, I'm gonna ha- I have to destroy this people. They are too evil. They are too wicked. They turn away from me so often. I just saved them from Egypt. They've just been delivered from this mighty empire by my grace. They've seen my power. I've opened the very sea for them to walk across on dry land. And yet they turn away from me again. And God said, I will destroy them. And Moses pleaded with God. He said, Lord, relent. Don't pour out your wrath on them, please. And it says, the Lord relented from the disaster that he'd spoken of bringing on the people. Moses stood in that breach. He stood there in that gap before the very wrath of God himself. Before the God's wrath. Can you imagine that? He pleaded with him for mercy and to show forbearance. God halted his wrath for a time. But Moses couldn't pay for the weight of sin on mankind. He couldn't pay for that. Only for a small time would God's wrath be turned away. And you know, what a terrible thing to hear that there is no one to stand in the breach. That there is no one to stand there before the wrath of God. A wall is for protection. You build a a big wall around a city to protect it, to keep it from harm. And any sieging enemy knows that when there's a gap in the wall, when the gates are knocked down or the wall is crumpled through mining or a catapult or whatever else, you draw your sword, you set your face and you run into that gap. That gap is a weakness. That gap is open season. There's no stopping them now. How many terrible things have happened when a gap in a wall has been found over history? How many awful things have happened? Moses, he stood in that breach for Israel. And it wasn't an army of men that faced Moses. It was the wrath of the living God. It was God's anger against sin that he faced. Imagine that great wave. Imagine a tsunami which is higher than you can see, longer than you can even begin to imagine. Imagine it. It's unstoppable. It's never ending. There's such ferocity in there. There's such holy anger. Imagine that. Imagine this terrifying picture as it comes towards us. What can we do? Where can we go? Where can we hide? This beating of the waves against this wall. What can we do? We hear this pounding. We hear this pounding. What do we do? Where do we go? Where do we hide from this? How terrifying is that sound of God's wrath? How terrifying. And then there's a breach found. There's a gap found. And our flimsy protection, it can't hold it back. It can't. And God says, there is no one to stand in the gap. There's no one to stand there before this mighty wave. His wrath is inevitable. It's unstoppable. Justice will be done. God is good. God is holy. There's no unclean thing in him. Oh, that there would be someone to stand in that breach. That there would be someone to stand there for us. That someone would be able to bear that weight of sin. To bear that weight of God's anger. I ask you all here. Who's going to stand in that gap for you? Who will stand in that breach for you? Maybe you say, well, I'm not a bad person. God can't be angry with me. Whose standard are you measuring yourself by? Is it your standard? Let me tell you something. The only measurement that matters is God's measurement. The only calculation of note is Yahweh's. The only assessment to pay attention to is the divine assessment. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's what God says about us. There is no one who does not sin. That's what God says. None is righteous, not one. No one understands. No one seeks after God. No one does good. That's what God says. We've all lied, we've all hated, we've all lusted, we've all stolen, we've all desired something that's not ours. We've all broken his law. Who will stand in that breach for us? Who can bear the weight of God's wrath? My wife talked to a lady uh, a few days ago. And she said, when my wife asked, so tell me about God's work in your life. Tell me what God's done in you. When did you become a Christian? What did God do? And she was very offended by that question. She didn't like that question. She said, you know, I, I've always been a Christian. It's just in my DNA. 
Okay, interesting statement. So she thinks that because her parents have been Christians, because she grew up in a Christian home, that she's good to go. Her foundation, her idea is to put her DNA in the breach before God's wrath. How do you think that's going to hold up? I've spoken to many others who, who said, they, well, I've said a prayer. I've said a prayer. I've prayed a prayer. I went to a concert once, and they, uh, at the end of the concert, when they'd, they'd sung, it was a Christian concert and so on, and they talked a bit about God. And, and at the end, they asked everyone to pull out their phones, those who were making a decision for God. And they told them to put their phone light on and wave them. Okay. But then the man at the front on that stage, he said something which chilled me to the bone. He said, everyone who's waved your phone light, welcome to the family of God. What? Some people try and put their phone light, their little phone before the wrath of God. Some people try and put a little prayer before the wrath of God. What's that going to do? How can that halt anything? That won't even stand up for a second. Others put good deeds there. They said, well, I've done good things. I've helped people. Well, that's good. But they pile that gap full of bricks of self-righteousness. And the mortar they use to bind those bricks together is empty hope. How do you think that's going to hold up before God's anger against their sin? And how many other things do we place before God's wrath? Do we not know that God's a consuming fire? Do we not know that no one can stand before him? Who can endure the heat of his anger? His wrath is poured out like fire and the rocks are broken into pieces by him. Nahum chapter 1 verse 6. Oh, that there would be someone to stand in that breach. Well, I have good news. I have good news for you. God has sent one greater than Moses to stand there. That's why my eyes are ever towards the Lord. The Lord, he knew my helplessness. He knew I couldn't help myself. He knew I couldn't stand in that breach. He sent Jesus, who's fully God and fully man. Jesus the Messiah, Jesus the Christ, who would fulfill all the Old Testament law for me. Only a perfect sacrifice could stand there. Only perfection, only the Son of God. For God so loved the world. What love is this? How, how glorious is this love? And this was God's plan. So it's God's plan for eternity. And you know, I know God now. I know him. I'm not going to put my self-righteousness in that gap. I'm not going to build those bricks. I'm not going to put empty prayers or my DNA there or my little phone torch. I'm not going to put that before God's wrath and anger. Instead, I'm going to put Christ's blood there. I'm going to hold on with every strength that I can in my fingers. I'm going to hold on to that cross. I'm going to hold on to the sacrifice of Christ. I will not let go. I know that nothing else will save me from that terrible wave. I will stand before God and I will trust in the sacrifice of his son. That's what I'm going to put my confirmation in. That's what I'm going to put my strength and assurance in. So my eyes are ever toward the Lord because he has stood in that breach for me. He's pulled me out of the snare of sin. That's why I love him. My assurance comes from that strong wall all around me. This wall is built with the bricks of Christ's righteousness. Those are much better bricks. The mortar is Christ's blood. Oh, that's so much more stable. The foundation is Christ. The cornerstone is Christ. Christ is all in all. Without him, we can do nothing. Without him, we have no hope. Without him, our faith is futile. Without him, we could never stand holy and blameless before God. He's paid the price for me. And I stand with his righteousness imputed to me. When God looks at me, he doesn't see my sin. He sees the perfection of Jesus. Oh, that's why I love him. And you know, my eyes are ever towards the Lord because only in him will I find salvation. Only in him. There's no other name under heaven given by which men may be saved. Who else could we turn to? Where else are we going to go? People turn to everything but God. They try and find enlightenment in themselves. They try and drown conviction in the pleasures of this world. They try and pay for their infinitely weighty sin. Never even going to make a dent. But there's one advocate for us who intercedes on our behalf with the Father. That's Jesus. 
There's one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. I'm so glad there's only one mediator. I'm so glad I don't need to ask a man to pray to God for me. I don't have to go to the Pope and say, Pope, please pray for me. How can I stand? What do I do? Pray to God for me. No. I pray to God himself. I ask him. Jesus is the author and the finisher of my salvation. That's who I look to. That's why I love him. You know, he calls all men everywhere to repent. All men. Every person he calls to repent. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Acts 17 verse 30. How gracious to call even the most hardened sinner to God. To call the worst of the worst by our standard to repent. To call the lowest of the low to turn to him. To call the wealthiest, the most powerful to turn to him. You know, we don't have to earn this invitation. We don't have to do anything. He calls everyone to turn to him. The biblical definition of repentance is a change of mind that results in a change of action. You can't put your faith in Jesus if you don't believe he's done anything. And you can't really understand your sin until you acknowledge that God is holy and that there is sin in you. It it just doesn't mean anything. So it has to be real faith in us. And one of the Holy Spirit's roles in the Godhead is to convict the world concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment. John 16. Isn't that quite amazing? The Holy Spirit, he convicts sinners of their sin. Hmm. Not only does God provide a way of salvation, provide himself to stand in that breach before his own wrath. He doesn't just throw out a general invitation and drop leaflets from the sky and said, come along, there's a way out of this mess you're in. He does that. Oh, he does. But he does more than that. He knocks on the doors of every man's heart. He says, hello, hello, I'm here. I am God and you are in deep, deep trouble. But it's okay. It's okay. I'm righteous. And yes, my judgment's coming. And yes, you're a sinner. But turn to me. Isn't that that amazing? God himself comes to men individually and he says, turn to me. The Holy Spirit, who is God himself, he comes to each man to convict them of their sin. How amazing is that? It's not just an idea that we, we throw out at people. God himself goes and he says, you're a sinner. Turn, repent. In John 15, it says, you did not choose me, but I chose you. This is Jesus speaking. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, John 6. Oh, to be drawn by God, to be drawn by God himself to this salvation. That's why my eyes are ever towards the Lord. That's why I love him. And you know, my eyes are ever towards him because salvation is through faith, through faith. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. Faith, it's not just an intellectual agreement. I can convince someone that God exists. It's not particularly hard. There's a lot of proof for that. There's a lot of reasons to believe that God does exist. But that's not going to save someone. That's not going to give them saving faith. Faith is active. It's not just intellectual agreement. It's more than that. It requires placing trust. It pr- Putting all your confidence into something. That's what faith is. And without faith, we can't be saved. By grace, through faith, is our salvation. And without faith, we can't even please God. It's so central to Christianity. It's so central. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Whoever believes in him. Do you like that simplicity? Do you like that? I love that. Just believe. Just have faith in God. How easy is that? Could God make it any more easy? He doesn't ask us to buy anything. He doesn't ask us to be a nice person to accept faith. We don't have to earn this gift. Salvation, it's just a free gift of God. Just believe. Just have faith. (laughs) 
Could he make it any easier? I spoke to a man a couple weeks ago and I told him the gospel. I told him what God had done for me. I told him why I love him. And he said to me, you know, Gideon, I like what you're saying, but I've seen too much. I've been around the world and I've seen too much suffering and this and that and all. And he says, I just can't believe in something so simple. I just can't. It just didn't make sense to him. I knew some apologetics, so I I pointed out to him why we know God exists. I pointed out to him all the evidence for Scripture being the Word of God, all the prophecies that have been fulfilled. There's so many. They're so specific. You can't argue that's not divine. There's no other book that was written over 1,500 years and has such unity, written by more than 40 people, around 40. That can't be anything but divine. But you know, unless the Holy Spirit works in a soul, unless the Holy Spirit comes to a man or a woman and illuminates this truth, reveals to them, brings new life to them, even if you have intellectual agreement, it doesn't matter. It's not going to do anything. You can believe this is true, but you have to know it's true. The Holy Spirit has to reveal it to you. The Holy Spirit has to give you new life. That's what salvation is. And I pray for that man. I ask that the Holy Spirit would prove to him my words be true. I pray for him often. I long to see him in heaven with me. But all my arguments, all my pleading, everything I have, it doesn't matter. It's not by might, it's not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. If the Holy Spirit doesn't help me, if the Holy Spirit doesn't empower my words, I have nothing. I can say nothing, I can do nothing. So my eyes are fixed on the Lord. I love him because of how simple faith is. How simple it is. Hmm. I love that. How beautiful is that? And I love him because it's only through his intervention. It's only through him moving in the souls of man that true faith can be found. I love that. I love him for that. I love him for being so involved in our lives, so involved in our salvation. I love him for drawing sinners to himself. God is good. I could, I, honestly, I could preach to you for days about the goodness of God. I, I would never run out of subjects to speak about. I could speak about how he's the sustainer of life, how if he just took his hand from us, we would just drop dead. If he just took his breath from us. I could tell you how he holds this universe together by his power. How glorious is that? He's so involved in our lives. He's so present with us, always. He's not in heaven just looking around, smoking a pipe and with a really long beard. He's, not, he's involved so intimately in his creation. He is here now. He is sustaining your very life. I love him. How amazing is that? I could tell you about his patience, such forbearance. Oh, he's been so patient with me. I'm very stubborn. He's been so patient with me. His kindness, it's led me to repent. His patience, it awes me every day. I said, Lord, why me? Why have you plucked me out of my sin? I love you for that. I don't understand, but I love you for that. I could tell you of so many great men and women who've died for their faith who've given everything to share this gospel, this glorious message. I love God for doing his work in other souls. I love to look around and say, oh, I know the work of God's grace and that man's life there and that lady's life over there. I know this. I've heard these stories. I love him for that. I could read you the Bible. I could pull out passages and chapters which I've wept over that have brought me such comfort. I love him for giving me his word, for giving me the Bible. I love him for that. I could tell you of the Holy Spirit's work in my life to guide me, to consistently point me in the right direction. The voice behind me saying, that is the way, walk in that way over there. Don't you turn to the left or the right. I love him for that. He doesn't just leave me to get on with it. He's always with me. I love him because there's such sanctification in me. He's cleansing me. He's convicting me of my sin. And I'm saying, okay, Lord, I'm going to put that down. I'm going to turn away from that and I'm going to follow you harder. I love him for that cleansing in me. 
I love him that I now have the power to resist sin. I was so stuck before the Holy Spirit was with me. I was so helpless without him. I'm able to forgive people who wrong me now because I've begun just the smallest glimpse to understand what God has forgiven me of. How can I be angry? How can I hold anything against someone when God has forgiven me such a great debt? How could I ever hold anything against anyone? God has saved me. He's cleansed me. He's brought me out of hell. How could I hold anything against? How could I not forgive? How could I not love the men and women around me? How couldn't I preach this glorious gospel to men and women? I love him. All he asks is obedience. All he asks is follow me. How small a thing. I want every believer, I want every man and woman I meet, I want them to understand what Paul said when he said, thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. I want us to think, wow, Lord, this gift is so beyond my understanding. It's so beyond anything I could have ever comprehended. Oh, Lord, why me? Why did you choose me? Why did you plug me out of my sin? Thank you. Thank you, Lord. That's what I want in our lives. That's true Christianity. That's the attitude that will allow you to die for your faith. A great Puritan, Isaac Ambrose, he wrote this. Only Christ is the whole of man's happiness, the sun to enlighten him, the physician to heal him, the wall of fire to defend him, the friend to comfort him, the pearl to enrich him, the ark to support him, the rock to sustain him under the heaviest pressures as a hiding place for the wind, as a cupboard for the tempest, as rivers of water in a dry place, and as a shadow of the great rock in a weary land. Only Christ is that ladder between earth and heaven, the mediator betwixt God and man, a mystery which angels of heaven desire to pry into. You read something like that and you say, wow, that man was grateful to God. That man understood God. He understood something of his redemption. He understood something of why we would sing such praises with true worship to him. He got it. Would we all have such a heart to ponder the things of God? Would we all love him more? Would we all spend time thinking of this indescribable gift, this gift which is inexpressible? I ask that you would, each day, put some time towards that, to pondering God's goodness in your life. Let's pray. Oh Lord, thank you for your unsearchable riches. Thank you that we can go on for eternity and never uncover even the smallest amount of your goodness, Lord. Lord, I ask that you would help us all to count all things as loss for the sake of knowing you. I ask that we would understand your love which surpasses all knowledge, Lord that you would, by your Holy Spirit, reveal to us your love and your grace in our life. Lord, I pray that every Christian here would make it their life's aim to know you more, to grow in your grace, to grow in the knowledge of you, Lord. Change us, Lord. Lord, I pray that we would all gaze on your beauty, that we would all love you. I ask that you would draw more souls to you, that you would... Go to each man individually and you would draw them to this glorious salvation. Lord, I ask that you would do this. Would you send souls to us that I could share the gospel with them, Lord? I would see that light come into a man's eyes as he understands who you are and what you've done for him. Oh Lord, I long to see more of that. Not by might nor by power, but by your Holy Spirit. Thank you that it's not by my efforts, it's not by my energy that man is saved. It's not by how eloquent I am or how many big words I know, Lord. It's by your spirit that empowers. Thank you, it's so simple. Unless you're with us, we could do nothing. Thank you for keeping us humble, Lord. And we ask, we ask this in your name. Oh, blessed Prince of Peace, glorious King. Thank you, Jesus. Would we love you more? Amen.